If you ask any brand new medical student what they want to learn first, nope, it's not the Krebs cycle, it's how to sew somebody up. Suturing a wound is a core skill for surgeons, ER docs, as well as nurses, PAs, and doctors in primary care. Whether you're a beginner student or someone who wants to brush up on your skills, this video will show you how to suture the right way to get the best results. And at the end, we'll share some expert tips to avoid suturing pitfalls. Whether it's a surgical incision or a laceration you're closing, the goal is the same. Maintain the wound edges together throughout the healing process so the skin and subcutaneous tissues can heal properly and with a good cosmetic result. There are various suturing techniques used for different purposes. The most common skin closure is a simple interrupted suture, and that's what we're going to discuss here. Here are the supplies you'll need to get started. A needle driver, a set of toothed forceps, suture scissors, suture material itself, and something to practice on. You can buy a practice suturing pad like these ones, but a cheap and pretty realistic alternative is a banana, and it's a tasty source of energy on call. Sutures come in packages like this, with a label on the outside telling you all about the needle shape and size, as well as the type and diameter of the suture thread itself. For closing skin, we'll usually use a 3O or 4O nylon or polypropylene or proline with a cutting needle. This allows for easy suture placement and minimizes the likelihood of scarring or infection. These are non-absorbable, so they'll need to come out at some point down the road. More on that later. After thoroughly cleaning the wound and using local anesthetic to numb the wound edges, you're ready to begin. The needle driver has two rings for your fingers and is ratcheted, meaning that it locks as you close it. There are two common ways to hold the needle driver. The first is to insert your thumb and fourth finger into the rings with the index finger extended along the shaft. Placing your index finger here gives you additional fine motor control. To open the jaws, push your thumb away from your ring finger. This is how most beginners start out. But as you get more comfortable, many surgeons switch to a palmed grip where you hold the rings in your palm like so. Palming the needle driver gives you a greater range of motion as you supinate and pronate your wrist with the downside that it's a little trickier opening the driver when it's ratcheted. Surgical needles have three parts, the point, the body, and the swage. You should only grip the needle in the flattened body portion to avoid damaging the precision tip or the hollow swage that holds the suture. Grasp the needle about two-thirds of the way back along the body. With a new suture, you can grasp it straight from the package. After that, do your best to handle the needle with the forceps, not your fingers. Ow! You want the needle direction to be 90 degrees to the needle driver. Avoid angling your needle and grasp with the tips, not deep in the jaws. Use the forceps to gently grasp the skin edge and lift up to visualize both entry and exit points. Pronate your wrist so the needle tip is facing straight down about 3 to 5 millimeters from the wound edge and insert it into the skin at a 90 degree angle. Now, rotate your wrist to mimic the curvature of the needle so the tip emerges in the wound from the sidewall. You may need to use your forceps to reflect the skin for better visualization. Ideally, the depth of your suture path should be about the same as the overall width, so usually about 0.5 to 1 centimeters. Continue to rotate the needle through until most of it is sticking out of the wound. Let go of the skin edge and grab the needle body with your forceps. Now release the needle driver and pull the needle through the rest of the way. Pull most of the suture through the initial bite. Now do the other side. Grasp the skin edge and lift up. Enter the tissue at 90 degrees and at the same depth as your first side. Rotate your wrist to drive the needle in a circular path so it emerges from the skin at 90 degrees and the same distance from the wound as your entry point. You can use your forceps to push down and stabilize the skin, which makes this step easier. Once more, grasp the needle with your forceps and let go with the needle driver. Pull the suture through until you have a tail of about 2 to 4 centimeters. Now drop the needle on your sterile field. Don't worry, it's not going to hurt anything. Now it's time to secure the suture by performing an instrument tie. Hold your needle driver between the two suture ends in the same orientation as the wound. Grab the long end with your other hand and wind it loosely around the tip of the driver once and then again one more time. Then reach with the needle driver and grasp the short tail. Pull the tail through the loops and pull gently until the knot is lying on the skin and the wound edges are together. Pull your tails perpendicular to the wound, not parallel, to ensure the knot lies flush with the skin. Let's see that again. Needle driver lined up with a wound. Loop once, loop twice. 
grab the tail and pull both ends across the wound, making the knot lie flat. The first throw, which has two loops, provides extra friction against the next throw, which is useful when using slippery suture material like nylon. Together, these three loops are what's known as a surgeon's knot. You don't need to kill it. A knot that is too tight strangulates the tissue, causing ischemia and scarring. Just get it snug. Approximate, don't strangulate. For the next throw, lay the needle driver in the same orientation and wrap the long end around it once from the outside. Grab the tail and pull through. This time, your hands will end up on opposite sides from the first throw. This locks the square knot. Finally, we'll do one last single throw in the same manner, pulling it again in opposite directions to the last throw. Pull the knot to one side of the wound. This takes the knots off the healing wound edge and prevents them from interfering with healing. Trim both ends with scissors to about five millimeters of length. What we've just described is a two bite technique, but if the wound is well approximated already, you can go through and through in one bite. Regardless of the number of bites, it's essential to create slight eversion of the wound edges, meaning they pout out a little bit. Mwah. The reason for this is twofold. You want dermis contacting dermis to create good wound strength as it heals. An inverted wound edge puts two layers of keratinized epidermis together, which won't heal well, so the wound repair is more likely to fail. And secondly, as a wound heals, it'll contract, pulling the everted edges down to lie flat. With an inverted wound edge, that contraction will create a depressed scar, which is a bad cosmetic result. Which brings us to... Here are some suturing tips and tricks. First, the shape of your bite is important to ensuring proper eversion. Entering and exiting the skin at 90 degrees creates a shape like this, which promotes eversion. A common novice error is to enter on a shallow trajectory, which promotes inversion and poor wound healing. When you're looping the suture over the needle driver, make sure you go from outside in. This creates a square knot or a reef knot, which is strong. If you loop from inside out, you'll be creating a granny knot, and everyone knows that grannies are sweet, but not strong. Keep your needle drivers in the middle of the two ends of the suture to make sure you're creating square knots. How do we space our sutures? Place your first suture in the middle of the wound and then bisect each open section with an additional suture. If you start at one end and move toward the other end, you risk misaligning the skin edges and getting a dog ear. The sutures should end up being spaced about as far apart as the width of your suture. You want to avoid crooked, unevenly spaced sutures like these ones. Different skin locations require different suture sizes and care because of skin thickness, location near a joint, and the desire for an excellent cosmetic result, such as on the face. Here's a handy chart with general guidelines for what to use where and when to remove the sutures. When you make your loops for the instrument tie, loop your needle driver well away from your knot. If you loop too close, you pull on the knot, releasing the tension and pulling it away from the skin. This creates the dreaded air knot. Loop using a good length of suture material and then pull down to create a nice snug knot against the skin. And lastly, don't use suture material when it's near the end. It's hard to make throws and the needle ends up close to your fingers. Not worth it. Open a new pack. And that's how you suture an incision or wound closed using simple interrupted sutures. Happy sewing!